This episode is scripted, narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher, with script assistance by John Ruths. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast, episode 58, in which we will be introducing the 1978 film version, the first portrayal of the story after the publication of the original novel. A couple of bits of burrow keeping. I've started uploading episodes to YouTube again after a long pause since October. If you haven't already subscribed to the YouTube channel, can I recommend it? And remember to hit the bell. Secondly, before we go any further, I need to address an elephant in the room. In 2020, a legal case involving the rights to wardship down between the estate of Richard Adams and the producer of the 1978 film was settled in the English High Court. I need to make it clear that I'm aware of this before going any further, in case it casts a shadow over what follows. I do not know what the exact details of the case were, other than there having been a dispute over royalties. I just find it very sad. Regardless of the legal minutiae that surrounded the film, it is much loved, and I would like to analyse it in this spirit, without that analysis being tainted by such controversy. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's start our long-awaited analysis of the film Watership Down, 1978. From book to film. This is a real change in gear for this podcast, and one that I must admit I've been looking forward to. We now move from discussion of pre chapter quotes to mise en scène, from the original portrayal of characters in words to their interpretation in a script by actors and artists, from descriptions of nature to background art and music. In order to do this, I plan to break the film up into roughly three to five minute chunks. I have already more or less decided on how to do this, but I am aware that the boundaries between episodes will have to be movable depending on how things go. What is beyond doubt is that there are only a limited number of obvious story breaks in the film, and certainly fewer than I need for the detail of analysis I want to do, and a chapter-by-chapter analysis using the story divisions from the novel is mostly impossible, as the story is so summarised and the order of some events are changed. So, basically, I have to come up with my own chapters and give them names, which should be fun. During the heyday of DVDs, this was an art that some DVD producers managed better than others. Of course, in these days of Netflix et al., it is no longer needed, as we can get to the bit we want to see straight away. But it was not always thus. Finding your place in a DVD could be very cumbersome, which made easy chapter breaks a necessity. And let's not even mention the days even longer ago of VHS. Some of the chapter names I come up with will be familiar to readers of the book, especially at the beginning of the story. However, others will be new. But at all times, they are designed to show respect to the integrity of both the story told in the original novel and in the film. For absolute clarity, the reference DVD I'm using for timings is the 2002 Deluxe UK edition. The cover design features Woundwort glowering above the title, with Fiverr, Hazel, Kihar, Blackberry and I think Holly beneath. Origin of a film. In the same way that it was difficult to culturally categorise the original novel in the early 70s, it was equally difficult to market a film version in the late 70s, not least because the idea of making a film started out as just that, a film of Watership Down, not an animated film, just a film. Martin Rosen, a theatre producer with dual US-UK citizenship, bought the rights by 1975 and production started that year. Only first he had to work out what technique to use. All he had wanted was to make a film version of this already incredibly popular book, but he wasn't an animator and had no directing experience. At first the option of somehow using live actors, perhaps ballet dancers, was considered, or of puppets. However, Rosen very soon decided that animation was the way to go, and thank goodness he did. At first, he hired American animation director John Hubley to actually make the film. Hubley was a veteran animator, inventor of Mr Magoo, for example, and was reaching the end of his career. Differences rapidly emerged between Hubley and Rosen, so Rosen took over as director, having never directed a film, let alone an animation, before. Sadly, Hubley died in 1977 before the film was released, though some of his work remains in it, notably the stylized opening sequence. 
On paper, this replacement by a first-time director looks like a recipe for disaster, but as we all know, it worked out. In a Hazel-like way, Rosen seems to have been aware of his shortcomings and hired the talent he needed to carry his vision through, allowing some creative leeway. He hired Terry Rawlings as editor, who had never edited an animation and was primarily credited before just as a sound editor. This too worked, as the main method of making animations back then was to record the soundtrack as a kind of radio play and then animate to that. Add to that a director who was only used used to what could be done with live action films and oddly a formula seems to have emerged for a truly unique animation to have been made. A method rapidly evolved of animating to the actors voices and then allowing them to re-voice having seen the animation so the portrayal of characters became fine-tuned over time. Background sounds were recorded in the area the film is set in rather than using buy-in effects and foley sounds such as rabbits running through grass were produced by such methods as running fingertips through trays of various materials. The art of Foley, at least, is one that has not changed much over time, even in the age of computer animation. The music for the film hit a major crisis after Malcolm Williamson, a a prestigious composer, left the country with hardly anything written. Angela Morley took over reluctantly and developed the score in two weeks, both from his initial sketches and her own original work, while the booked orchestra was borrowed by Jeff Wayne for his classic War of the Worlds. Art Garfunkel's Bright Eyes started out as an integrated part of the film score and only became a single in its own right after CBS Records decided to issue it as one, with Kihar's theme on the B-side. CBS did not have high hopes for it, and Garfunkel did not particularly like the song. However, Rosen's efforts to promote it paid off, and it rapidly became the classic we know and love as fans of the film, even causing the film to go back to number one in some nations after the song was released. I am, incidentally, the proud owner of an original copy of that single, bought in 1978. Being an independent film, it had no distributor in the UK at first. Rosen had to put up money to get it into major cinemas in London, and it took off from there. Rabbit Voices So who were the actors who portrayed our rabbit friends and enemies, and where will you have seen them? Many of them were not well known at the time, and some still are not. Others were well known then, and perhaps not so much now. Some of the cast had backgrounds mainly based around theatre, which accounts for the subtlety of some of the performances. It is also notable how many had acted in war films, given the military themes in the book. The two decades prior to the film were dominated by films on the theme of World War II in the UK, as our national identity became increasingly defined by the role of our nation in that war. I am focusing on the international nature of the listeners to this podcast in order to find the easiest ways to see these actors in real life, so to speak. Please note that this may mean I do not cite their best work as actors, just their most visible to an international audience as far as I can make out. I am also crediting the cast in the same order that they are at the end of the film. Hazel is probably best known as being voiced by John Hurt the year before an alien attached itself to his face in the film Alien, 1979. Interestingly, he would later play Woundwart using his older, gruffer voice in the first two seasons of the Watership Down TV series. Fiverr is portrayed by British comedy actor Richard Briers, not much known outside the UK probably, while Bigwig is played by the little-known Michael Graham Cox. It is a shame he is not well known, as it is easily the best voice portrayal of Bigwig. Briers is best known for his role in the 70s sitcom, British sitcom The Good Life. Cox is probably easiest spotted playing Captain Clemenson, escaping from the Germans through Dutch suburbia in a paratrooper's beret with Sean Connery in A Bridge Too Far. 1977. Captain Holly is played by John Bennett, who plays Dr Ehrlich in The Pianist, 2002. The best-known actor probably at the time was Sir Ralph Richardson, who plays the Chief Rabbit of Sandalford. He played the Supreme Being in Time Bandits, 1981. Another sitcom actor, Simon Cadell, plays Blackberry. He is best known for his role as Geoffrey Fairbrother in the British sitcom Heidi High. Terence Rigby plays Silver. He starred in a variety of TV police dramas and thrillers in the 60s and 70s, with his main accolades being on stage. He plays General Bukharin in the Bond film Tobora Never Dies, 1997. 
Incidentally, in this film, Silver seems to act as an amalgam of Hawkbit, Speedwell and Acorn, rather than actually portraying Silver. To that extent, you could argue that he is the second erased member of those who arrive on Watership Down, besides Strawberry. Roy Kinnear plays Pipkin. He played Henry Salt, father of Veruca Salt, in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, 1971. Richard O'Callaghan plays Dandelion. He is best spotted as Lewis Boggs, the son of the factory owner played by Kenneth Williams in Carry On At Your Convenience, 1971. This was the first one of the quintessentially British Carry On series to fail at the box office due to its portrayal of trade unions at a time when they were quite popular with the target audience. Denol Melliot plays Cowslip, a prolific actor. You will recognise him as Dr Marcus Brodie from the Indiana Jones movies. Stage actor Lynn Farley plays the cat. She was Mrs Bennett's sister, Mrs Phillips, in the 1995 BBC version of Pride and Prejudice. Mary Maddox plays Clover. She played Ms Fossington Gore in the UK TV adaptation of The Siri Secret Diary of Adrian Mole, aged 13 and three quarters, in 1985. Kiha is played by Zero Mostel, the crazy-haired producer from Mel Brooks' The Producers, 1967. Veteran film actor Harry Andrews plays Windwart. The role I remember him best in is as Regimental Sergeant Major Wilson in The Hill, 1965, also starring Sean Connery, but you will have seen him and recognise him if you watch British war films from the 60s. TV actor Hannah Gordon plays Heisenthwaite. She can be seen playing Anne Treves in The Elephant Man, 1980. Captain Campion is played by Nigel Hawthorne, who played the title role in The Madness of King George in 1995. TV actor Clifton Jones plays Blackavar. His best-known role is as David Kano in Space 1999. He was one of two black actors in the cast. Vervain and Cherville are played by Derek Griffiths, the other black actor. He was mainly a UK comedy TV actor. You can spot him as Saladin in Up the Chastity Belt, 1971. Also a film very much in the carry-on tradition. Veteran Shakespearean actor Michael Horden plays Frith and the narrator. Probably easiest seen as Sir George Hodge in Gandhi, 1982. Another veteran, Joss Ackland, plays the Black Rabbit, or as an Ella Threra. He is the villain Chuck Denomalos in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, 1991. Lucy, the human girl, is played by Michelle Price, who played a girl pupil in Maria Martin, also known as The Girl in the Red Barn, 1980. I think this was a UK drama documentary involving broadcaster Lucinda Lampton. This is the most obscure reference I'm a, I've come up with. And that is the whole credited cast of the film. Any other information on the cast will be gratefully received. I want to know who these people were when they gave their voices to this beautiful film. Sights and Sounds Watership Down was produced in the time before computer animation when making such a film involved a team of artists painting backgrounds, while another team drew, then painted each frame of the character's movements onto transparencies that were then photographed over the backgrounds. This will not be news to those of us over a certain age, but it can be hard to appreciate just how labour-intensive animation was back then. This is why animated films tended to be far shorter than live action. Watership Down broke that rule at 90 minutes in length. Prior to Warship Down, Disney had been the standard for animation, with cute anthropomorphised creatures and simple morality at a duration designed to hold a child's attention. It was also usual for animations of a greater length to be musicals. The only concession to this in the film is the Bright Eyes sequence as Fiverr goes to find the wounded Hazel. Other songs were apparently written for the film, but were never used. While children's animations still tend to hold to the Disney model, which still works largely in that context, it can be easy to forget that popular animation back then never strayed from this standard. Watership Down broke that mould. Another way in which it broke the mould was in obtaining a use certificate in the UK, meaning universal, meaning that there was no restriction on the ages of those who could go and see it. The British Board of Film Classification seems to have assumed it was harmless as it was an animation, without even watching it. 
And so it was that I and many like me were able, at the age of 11, to go and see a film in which at one point a rabbit has his throat torn out by another rabbit with copious amounts of blood being spilled, and in which a seagull tells another rabbit to go away, only not using that phrase. It still amazes me to this day. There are adults my age whose first reaction when I tell them the subject of this podcast is to lightly recoil as they are taken back to that visit to the cinema that gave them nightmares for weeks. Such is its legacy. And, to quote Richard Adams, perhaps it would not have displeased him. Next time, we begin the film with the origin of El Ra and his thousand enemies. Mm-hmm.